After the break today, we're going to be having five uh, physicians who will be telling you about their experiences uh, transitioning to and run, running a third-party free practice. So what I thought I would do is to sort of go over some of the basics as far as Medicare payment options are concerned so that everybody has sort of the same s starting point of, of understanding. So that's what we're going to try and uh, cover today. And the first thing I think we need to address is the economic practice environment, basically understanding where we are today. And there are three main factors that we need to consider. Number one, the $15 trillion deficit. Number two, the Clinton-Gingrich sustainable growth rate formula. And number three, the $106 trillion in unfunded liabilities in Medicare and Medicaid. Now, this I'm just showing, it is the uh, SGR formula. I'm just showing for the purpose of, of demonstrating how bizarre and complex uh, this formula really is. And if you look down under C, you will see that it, it's attached to the gross domestic product. This is what the physician fee schedule update adjustment factor looks like. Again, it's another complex, bizarre formula. And as you see in the, uh, in the last line there, it incorporates the SGR. Now, the purpose of the SGR was to reduce physician expenditures in the Medicare program. But it didn't work. Every year since about 2002, the expenditures exceeded the, uh, the targets. So what was the flaw in the SGR? Well, the underlying assumption was that the cost of providing medical care would follow the gross domestic product. That's a rather bizarre assumption, but that was the assumption. However, the cost of running a medical practice grew faster than GDP. And this, uh, these two graphs uh, basically show the uh, cumulative practice cost, that's the upper graph, versus physician Medicare fees. And you'll see there's a little notch there in 2002. If you recall, that was the only year that the uh, f Medicare fee cut of about 4.8% actually went into effect, that they didn't do any temporary dock fix. Every year since then, however, they've done a little temporary dock fix, which has uh, resulted in either no change in fees or perhaps an increase of 1% or 2%. But as you can see, those two uh, lines are diverging and continue to diverge, that is, practice costs versus Medicare fees. Now, uh, likewise, the cost of fixing the SGR permanently has increased each and every time they've done one of these temporary dock fixes, to the point that it now, it's now estimated that to have a permanent fix of the SGR would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of about $300 billion. So with a $15 trillion deficit, the question is, how do you pay for repeal of the SGR formula? And of course, uh, the socialists will provide an answer to that every time. And the answer they will provide is, well, we need to tax people more, particularly those rich people. We just need to pay, have them pay more of their fair share so that we can do this. But if you look at the actual numbers, the top earners already pay the uh, bulk of federal taxes. And as you can see, the, uh, the top 50% of earners uh, pay about 97% of taxes as is. That means that the bottom 50% of earners only pay about 3% of federal taxes and nearly one third pay no tax at all. So the reality is, is even if the government confiscated 100% of the earnings of the top earners, it would not be enough to eliminate the $15 trillion budget deficit. And so the reality is, there is no money to permanently fix the SGR. This is an update. As you know, Congress on December 23rd, 2011, passed a temporary dock fix extending the 2011 Medicare fees for two months. This leaves a lot of physicians wondering, will this be deja vu all over again? In 2010, for instance, Congress uh, voted on uh, five temporary dock fixes. 
and this caused real financial havoc in a lot of physician offices, and it also was the cause of some very unusual recovery actions, that is, the government wanting money back from physicians as a result of all these temporary doc fixes. CMS also extended the annual Medicare participation enrollment period through February 14, 2012, Usually the uh, enrollment period extends only until December 31st of the year. And you may recall something called the Budget Control Act of 2011, which was passed in the summer of 2011, which basically stipulated that if the Committee on Deficit Reduction, the Joint Committee on Deficit Reduction, otherwise known as the Super Committee, if they failed to come up with something, that would automatically trigger a 2% cut per year in Medicare fees for the next 10 years, effective in 2012. That translates to a 20% cut in physician Medicare fees over the next 10 years. The uh, temporary doc fix, which was uh, passed in December, also has led to claims processing delays. The Medicare contractors are holding the claims uh, for a period of time and it's also uh, caused a delay in Medicare contractors posting the 2012 Medicare fees. So depending on uh, where you are, what state and whatnot, if you go to your Medicare contractor website, you may find that the fees that they have posted are not the correct updated fees yet for 2012. And note that the 2012 Medicare fees will reflect the 2% automatic sequestration cuts as well as specific RVU cuts in fees for various medical specialties. Uh, so the Medicare fees are actually a combination of the SGR and the RVUs and the RVUs are still going to, RVU fee cuts are still going to go into effect and will affect certain specialties uh, much more than others in terms of cutting fees. So there's a lot of talk, well, we need to repeal the SGR, we need to overhaul the SGR, but be careful what you ask for. Asking for repeal of the flawed SGR formula does no good if Congress implements something worse. Any replacement for the SGR will likely include a mechanism to bend the physician fee curve downward even further than it is now. So what are some of the proposals for a new Medicare payment system? Well, MedPAC has come up with a proposal. It's sort of the divide and conquer tactic, which pits specialists against uh, primary care physicians and vice versa. It proposes 5.9% cuts per year for three years for all specialists, followed by a seven-year pay freeze and a pay freeze for primary care physicians for the next 10 years. There's also payment based on outcomes, which is basically a proposal where payment for performance has basically morphed into payments for outcomes. Then, of course, there's the bundled discounted payment system. Uh, as a result of Obamacare, uh, Medicare is implementing beginning in 2012 uh, the bundled payments for uh, care improvement initiative. And these will be Medicare payments that are bundled, like a single payment sent to a hospital, for example, then the hospital will determine how much they're going to provide to the physicians that provide services. And the discounts are usually in the 2 to 3% range or greater. Then there's the Ryan Wyden plan, which you may have heard about, which involves the gradual transition to privatization of Medicare. And this is where seniors would receive a set amount of money to purchase private insurance, known as premium support, and the amount seniors would receive would increase or decrease with actual cost of insurance policies. And you'll note the quote uh, there from the uh, Washington Post where Ryan and Wyden basically acknowledged that the plan uh, might not result in any more savings than under current law. And I would point to the premium support. The premium support, of course, comes from taxpayer funds. The Ryan Wyden plan would also uh, allow for the traditional Medicare program option. And of course, this or any other replacement for the SGR is not likely going to be looked at by Congress until 2013. So what are your Medicare payment options as they currently exist? Well, there's basically four. 
participating physician, non-participating physician, opted out physician, and disenrollment from Medicare. We're going to go through some of the definitions here just so everybody understands. A participating physician is an enrolled physician who signs an agreement with Medicare agreeing to accept assignment on all Medicare patients and who accepts the allowed amount by Medicare as payment in full for medically necessary covered services as defined by Medicare. A non-participating physician is an enrolled physician who does not sign a contract with Medicare and who may choose to accept assignment or not accept assignment on a case-by-case -case basis for medically necessary and covered services as defined by Medicare. Non-participating physicians can charge no more than the limiting charge for covered services provided. So although the physician is non-participating, he or she is limited by how much he can charge Medicare patients. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. An opted out physician is an enrolled physician who chooses to opt out of Medicare for a two year period. And this was, of course, made available to us by the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Neither physician nor patient can submit a claim to Medicare except for emergency or urgent services for services provided by the opt-out physician during the opt-out period and Medicare limiting charges do not apply for the opted-out physician. Opted-out physicians who have an NPI can order tests and make referrals to other entities or physicians who are in the Medicare system and Medicare will pay as per Medicare policies. There's a special circumstance where opted out physicians cannot make private contracts with patients in urgent or emergency situations. In that particular situation, the opt out physician basically becomes a non participating physician for the purposes of if the physician decides to file a claim. And the opted out physician can file a claim in that circumstance and either accept assignment or not accept assignment and the limiting charges would apply in that situation. You should note that participating and non-participating physicians are subject to all the rules, regulations, and policies governing the provision of services in the Medicare program and that opted out physicians are not subject to the Medicare rules, regulations, and policies that apply to PAR and non-PAR physicians. So medically necessary determinations, correct coding initiatives and whatnot, which would apply to participating and non-participating physicians, do not apply to opted out physicians. As far as changing status from participating to non-participating, uh, these are the things you need to know. Number one, the annual decision to change can be made between November 12th and December 31st of each year. The status, the change in status is then effective January 1st of the following year and generally is binding and in, in effect for the entire year. The Medicare carrier must receive the request for change in status by December 31st. Now, as a result of this uh, recent uh, update, CMS has extended the enrollment status change period to February 14, 2012, which has created a unique opportunity for participating physicians to change to non-PAR status and then subsequently opt out if they choose to do so. The other thing you need to understand are federal and state balance billing laws which affect the limiting charge. The federal balance billing law this again applies to non-participating physicians, is that those physicians are allowed to charge 115 percent of the non-PAR allowed amount. Now you need to be aware that some states also have state Medicare balance billing laws, and one example is the state that I live in, New York State, has a New York State balance billing law whereby a, physicians are allowed to charge 105 percent of the non-PAR allowed amount, and this applies to all services except 99201 to 99215, which are office visit codes, and 99341 to 99353, which are home service codes. And for those particular 
coded services, the federal balance billing limit applies. So it's a little, it's a little complex, but that's what it is. There is a pitfall, of course, in the states that do have their own Medicare state balance billing laws in that the Medicare carrier fee schedule represents and shows only the federal balance billing limits. The state balance billing limits have to be calculated by the physician, and if you end up just using the balance billing limits provided by the Medicare contractor, you may be in violation of state balance billing laws, so you have to be somewhat careful there. Also note that the non-PAR allowed amount is 95% of the PAR allowed amount. So based on the federal balance billing limit, a non-PAR physician's fee will be 9.25% more than the PAR amount, and based on the New York State balance billing limit, a non-PAR physician's fee will be 0.25% less than the PAR amount. So again, it depends on if you live in a state where there's a Medicare state balance billing law and what it is. This is an example in New York State, for example. If a non-PAR physician does not accept assignment, he can bill the patient $99.75 for this particular service where the PAR allowed amount would be $100 and the non-PAR allowed amount would be $95. The physician can file the claim and the patient receives reimbursement from Medicare according to uh, the deductible and copay, of course. If the non-PAR physician accepts assignment, the physician receives $76 from Medicare, and again the deductible and copay apply, and the remaining uh, $19 is collected directly from the patient. So whether the non-PAR physician does better than or worse than a PAR physician in terms of total revenue depends on the type of services the physician provides and success in collecting directly from patients. So what is the procedure for opting out of Medicare? Well, it's different for non-participating versus participating physicians. Non-participating physicians can opt out of Medicare any time during the year. A copy of the opt-out affidavit must be provided to the Medicare carrier no later than 10 days after the first contract to which this affidavit applies is entered into. Now this is what the law says, and you'll note that it, it says Medicare carrier with uh, parentheses S. You have to file it with each Medicare carrier that you do business with. Although this is what the law says, it's highly recommended that you provide the affidavit well in advance of the plan start of the opt-out period so as to basically accommodate the Medicare bungling factor. There's also a 90-day grace period after filing the affidavit during which time the physician may withdraw the opt-out affidavit. So if you, you, make, you file the affidavit and you decide things are not going well, you have 90 days to withdraw it. One caveat, you want to be sure to check with any other contracts you may have or affiliations you may have which may require you to participate in Medicare before you opt out. The procedure for participating physicians is they can only opt out four times during the year. The, Medi the Medicare contractor must receive the opt out affidavit one month before the beginning of each quarter. So the deadlines for carrier receiving opt-out affidavits are March 1st, June 1st, September 1st, and December 1st. And you can download very clear step-by-step -step instructions for opting out, the, the opt-out affidavit itself, uh, Medicare compliant private contracts for use with patients, sample letters informing patients of your decision to opt out, and you can find answers to questions about opting out on our AAPS website. You can also find on our AAPS website a list of physicians by state who have opted out, various videos of talks such as those that will be given today by opt-out physicians about their experiences and tips for success in their own specific specialties and physicians who are willing to serve as mentors and answer specific questions regarding the opt-out experience in their particular specialty. And of course, AAPS also offers Thrive Not Just Survive seminars like this one a couple of times per year, uh, various locations throughout the country. And again, uh, you can go to the AAPS uh, website for those uh, interested in course details and registration. So here are some of the tips for opting out. Number one, start at least six months in advance 
of beginning of the opt-out period. This provides time to inform your patients of the changes and time for you and your staff to adjust. Filing the opt-out affidavit six months in advance of the start date also will allow for possible delays caused by Medicare bungling. That is the Medicare contractor, they may lose it, they may say later they never received it, and, and you want to start far enough in advance that you can get around that problem. Number two, uh, we recommend you send a cover letter, certified mail, return receipt to the Medicare carrier with the opt-out affidavit requesting written acknowledgement that the opt-out has been properly accomplished. This may help protect you later on when the bungling Medicare carrier says they never got your opt-out affidavit. And by the way, since they didn't receive it, you're not uh, legally opted out and you must refund all that money to the various patients you've seen and file Medicare claims. So you want to avoid that. Number three, you want to mark your calendar so that you will remember to renew your opt-out six months in advance of the end of the two-year opt-out period. You also want to remember to renew your patient private contracts every two years also. You also should make sure that there are office procedures in place so that no Medicare claims are filed except for emergencies and urgent care situations. So what are some of the factors to consider in making the opt-out decision? Number one, you need to consider the total revenue equation. That is, gross revenue minus expenses equals net revenue. One thing that a lot of physicians fail to consider is the huge administrative costs that they incur simply by dealing with the Medicare program. Once you eliminate that huge, unnecessary administrative cost, you may find that the total revenue equation on the net revenue side does just fine. You need to look at the type of services you provide the patient population, and make some type of assessment about the ability to collect directly from your patients. Number three, you need to consider the cost of you and your staff keeping up with ever-changing Medicare rules and regulations, and the cost of filing and having to refile and appeal various uh, Medicare claims relative to the small revenue generated. And number four, it may also be helpful to find some type of niche service, if possible, and to think about how you would market your uh, services to inform your patients the benefits of seeing an opted out physician. You need to consider the cost of non-compliance if you remain in the program. ICD-10, if you're not compliant with ICD-10 by October 1st of 2013, you'll be subject to a 100% cut in fee, meaning that your claims simply will not be processed. E-prescribing, beginning in 2012, if you're non-compliant with e-prescribing, you'll be subject to a 1% uh, cut, which goes to a 1.5% cut in 2013 and a 2% cut in 2014. Meaningful use, if you are non-compliant with meaningful use, fees will be cut by 1% in 2015, 2% in 2016, 3% in 2017, 4% in 2018 and 5% in 2019 and beyond. Physician quality reporting system, if you're non-compliant with PQRS, fees will be cut by 1.5% in 2015, 2% 2 in 2016 and beyond. So there's a considerable cost of sitting there and doing nothing. And if you're not compliant with all these uh, increased uh, re regulations, uh, they're gonna cut the fees uh, rather dramatically. This is what the true cost of dealing with the Medicare program uh, looks like. This is an uh, actual collection of correspondence uh, I had when I was a non-participating physician prior to the uh, availability of opting out of Medicare. This is correspondence that I had with HICVA, CMS, and Medicare related to uh, correcting errors that were made by the Medicare bureaucracy itself. In other words, Medicare bungling. And uh, this uh, little collection of correspondence I call Little Frank, and you can see the dimensions there in terms of height and weight. It weighs over 200 pounds worth of documentation. I call this Little Frank, which is short for Little Frankenstein, because it was a government-created monster that was literally eating me out of house and home. And this was the type of unnecessary, irritating, and harassing uh, Medicare expense that I got rid of at the time that I opted out of Medicare. 
There are non-financial considerations as well, which may be even more important. The freedom and the pleasure of practicing medicine again instead of practicing bureaucracy. How many people went into medicine expecting to practice bureaucracy? Number two, it's a very positive patient experience, and it also helps protect patient privacy because claims aren't filed. There's no fear of ruinous fines or prison time for inadvertent coding errors or running afoul of some obtuse Medicare law, rule, or regulation. There are a lot of uh, people out there that are scrutinizing physician Medicare claims right now. There are the Medicare private bounty hunters known as the RACs, the Recovery Audit Contractors. They have proprietary data mining software, and they're looking for irregularities so that they can recoup money already paid to physicians. And then there are the ZPICs. Again, these are like private mercenaries, the Zone Program Integrity Contractors, and their goal is to hook you up with some uh, criminal prosecution for uh, irregular claims that they find. Number four, simplification. Opted out physicians need not use any codes, no CPT codes, no ICD-9 codes in serving their Medicare patients because there's no claims to file, no more constant Medicare hassles, and uh, more time to spend actually treating patients and more time to spend with family. So basically, it's, uh, it results in the experience and the joy of uh, practicing medicine again. AAPS is currently exploring a potential fourth option of Medicare disenrollment, and this is discussed in the summer 2010 issue of our journal, uh, Is Medicare Voluntary?, which was an article written by Dr. Jane Orient. It's also discussed in uh, something we have posted, uh, a proposal to the California Medical Association, and it's also discussed in another uh, article that we just published in the winter 2011 issue of the journal, uh, Disenrollment from Medicare, a Fourth Option. Uh, you may also be interested in reading a brief review of private contracting by Andy Schlafly, which was also uh, very informative and was just published in the winter issue of our journal. And again, if you have specific questions about opting out, of Medicare or transitioning to a third-party free practice, uh, feel, feel free to call us at uh, the AAPS toll-free number. Thank you.